to start today. So welcome to the last fast pitch session of the 2022 Apri Summit. This is a fast pitch session on natural, natural resources. Um, just before we begin, I want to um, make a reminder to everybody, um, we're going to have four fast pitches in a row and then a question and answer session after that. Uh, during the fast pitches, you're welcome to submit questions uh, using the QR code on the back of your name tag. And uh, we'll filter them and answer them um, after the talks. So, uh, without any further delay, let's proceed. Um, I'm going to be the I'm going to be the first person giving a fast pitch today on mining inner and outer space. I'm hoping to show you that the technologies that we are interested in developing to save this world can also be used to build new ones. So, my name's Simon Freeman. I'm an RPE program director. So when we think about the important tasks that lie ahead of our society in the next 100 years or so, um, this is a really nice plot that summarizes perhaps the most important one. Uh, this is from the UN Environmental Program, and it shows uh, what we need to do to remain below the threshold of 2 degrees C of global warming um, in, in terms of decarbonization. So uh, the, by 2100, we're going to have to be a negative carbon economy, and to do that, we need to aggressively decarbonize through a multitude of technologies. But the bulk of the decarbonization is going to be through what they term conventional abatement technologies. That's wind energy, solar, uh, battery electric storage, battery electric mobility. And all these technologies require critical minerals. I'm talking about uh, metals such as copper, cobalt, manganese, and nickel. challenge is, you know, these, the extraction of those minerals from the earth leaves a footprint. And what good is it to try to save the earth by going to a zero carbon society if it's going to cost us the earth anyway? Um, there are some pictorial examples of some of the scars that on the landscape uh, that come out through open pit mining, and you have a, a tailings river there. And consider that these environmental in impacts are persistent. So these scars will remain hundreds of years after th uh, the mining has concluded. And of course, the land use conflicts um, arise from those scars as well. So uh, seafloor mining has been proposed as potentially a better way of extracting minerals from the earth. Uh, so the uh, idea is to extract minerals from these polymetallic nodules. So these are little rocks that uh, exist on the seafloor between, or primarily between Hawaii and Mexico at a depth of about four and a half kilometers. They consist of about 30% nic manganese, one and a half percent nickel, half a percent cobalt, and about one percent copper. And uh, there's a representative image of what they look like on the seafloor. They're collected using devices like that uh, yellow bulldozer-like thing and uh, connected via a riser attached to these very large uh, processing vessels. And life cycle analyses show that to go from uh, the raw material to the metal, uh, it potentially uh, consumes far fewer, far less energy and produces far less emissions than the terrestrial process equivalent. But there are problems. So if you look at some of that machinery on the left, you can imagine what that would do to seafloor ecosystems. Uh, furthermore, the resuspension of seafloor sediment is going to cause smothering to pelagic ecosystems and potentially valuable commercial fisheries. And lastly, it's recently been discovered that the resuspension of organic carbon um, in seafloor sediments that would otherwise be sequestered for geologic timescales is of significant concern for um, its contribution to climate change. So that organic carbon would become resuspended re in the water column, remineralize, and then be uh, emitted as CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, perhaps the, the biggest issue, though, is that uh, deep sea mining has never been profitable. So on this plot, you can see project, project costs versus project revenue. That black star is where we lie today. We're below the break-even line. That's the dashed diagonal line there. And the approach today is to try to eventually uh, reach profitability through economies of scale. So bigger mining operations, larger multiple collectors, uh, bigger ships, and the like. And while we'll, we may eventually reach profitability, the issue there is that the ecosystem impacts and the emissions also scale with the size of the operation. So at ARPA E, we've been thinking about new approaches to seafloor mineral extraction, uh, smaller, slower systems, 
uh, that are far less expensive in terms of operational expenditure because there's a high level of autonomy involved. And maybe then we'll be able to follow that blue line and reach profitability while producing fewer ecosystem impacts and less emissions. So just take a moment to consider what that might look like. So we have a, a notional uh, nodule collector there. Uh, imagine it being autonomous and uh, untethered. Uh, the system is going to have to collect minerals by itself, uh, potentially uh, perform navigation and problem solving tasks independently as well. And uh, the collection paradigm is not gonna be a continuous riser extracting nodules from the seafloor. It's gonna need to be periodic. And uh, that means that we can eliminate the very large surface ships required to continually transport and, and, and handle a riser. And uh, that reduction in surface expression is going to mean a dramatic decrease in cost. Now, this whole uh, operation is going to be reliant on renewable energy from the get-go, because the cost of transporting diesel thousands of miles out to sea is going to be prohibitive. And uh, we'll have to generate the energy to run this mining operation in situ from uh, sources such as offshore wind or some other method of uh, energy generation. And of course, uh, there'll be remote refueling underwater, but that, te that technology is fairly mature today. And lastly, when we consider the economics of periodic, periodic collection, I've got a, a little cartoon of a fishing boat there. That's not coincidental. So today, uh, sardines cost between two and three hundred dollars a ton. And coincidentally, that's about the same value as uh, these things, manganese nodules. So if that industry, which is um, the pelagic fisheries industry is the one, only one true scaled blue economy industry today, if that industry is able to achieve profitability at that price point, then maybe we can too. So we were thinking about some of the technical challenges associated with deep sea mining and some of the potential solutions, and we realized that there are other places where this technology could be useful as well. And uh, many of the environmental um, hazards and challenges associated with the deep ocean were similar to the ones that we'd find in deep space. So this is the same slide as before, except I've just changed the background, and uh, it's deep space instead of uh, the deep sea. And uh, while there are some differences, such as you know, dealing with atomically sharp dust, for example, many of the challenges are the same. So in a way, uh, deep sea mining, you could consider it as a, an inexpensive and convenient way to develop and vet technologies for deep space mining. And you may be thinking, you know, why think about deep space that's kind of quite far off in the future? And it would be except for this uh, system. So for those who aren't familiar, this is the, the SpaceX Starship with the, the super heavy booster. This is currently under development in Texas. If Starship is successful, it will be an iPhone moment for the industrialization of space. And the reason why is cost. So um, traditionally, it's taken about between $3,000 and $50,000 to lift one kilogram of mass to orbit. If Starship is successful, it will drop that cost to something below $200, or well, that's also they claim. And that's not just a cheaper way to launch your satellite. That really enables new industries and new development in space. And you could think of situations where, say, Caterpillar can think about building a space tractor. It'll still be a $50 million space tractor, but it'll be in space. And you can do wonderful things like build a lunar base or uh, create infrastructure on asteroids. And most importantly, what that will enable is for us to become a multi-planetary civilization. And it'll offer us resiliency against these uh, extinction-level events that happen now and then uh, to Earth. So I hope I've shown you through this uh, fast pitch that the technologies we're interested in developing today at Arthur E to save this world can also help us build new ones. So my name is Dr. Simon Freeman. I'm an Arthur E program director. Uh, please get in touch with me on ideas of how we can accelerate the development of future energy industries. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Dave Tu. Th thank you very much, Simon. If we could flip to the next slide, please. That's me. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, my, my name is uh, David Tu, I'm Program Director at RPE and, and a carbon-based engineer. I hope that will make sense, more, more sense in, in a minute. What I'd like to do is talk to you today about one of our ongoing programs called Differentiate, or more succinctly, D-Prime. Within Differentiate, what we're trying to do is leverage the transformational power of engineering to automate elements of the engineering, uh, automate elements of the process of invention. In some sense, by training very focused, but what I'd like to think of very capable, what I'll call silicon-based engineers. Um, a few words about um, the, the program. So what we're trying to do is, is again, leverage machi machine learning to develop machine learning enhanced design tools that enable carbon-based engineers to be more creative and productive, to hopefully enable them to design better energy products faster, to accelerate RPE's mission. Our focus today is, is progress that we made, challenges that we've encountered, and potential next steps. Um, in order to really, I'd say, focus the development efforts within Differentiate, we designed a, a, a design process framework. Uh, in some sense, engineers were always posed problems. We hypothesized solutions. We, we evaluate those solutions and keep iterating so hopefully ha we have a solution that it satisfies our requirements. What we'd like to do within differ Differentiate is develop optimizers that have domain-specific knowledge to hopefully enable them to be more efficient in trying to address domain-specific problems. At the same time, those, uh, those optimizers come, with, uh, come up with solution concepts. We want to be able to evaluate those solution concepts as fast as possible, hopefully instantaneously once trained. So we're also developing what we would call machine learning based surrogate models that make instantaneous high fidelity performance predictions once trained. Uh, these two tools effectively enable us to go around the loop much, much faster than we could otherwise, and hopefully enable us to get to a solution at lower cost in, in faster time. Again, optimizers, fewer iterations, surrogate models, faster evaluations. Of course, what we'd actually like to do is actually not iterate at all. We'd like to get the answer right the first time. So we like to develop what are called inverse design tools or generative models. Given a problem, run it through this tool and create an, hopefully an optimal design. In, in some sense, this is a one pass through. Um, if we can actually develop this capability, it enables the instantaneous generation of optimal, of, of optimal designs. So we're trying to do this for a few candidate problem areas, aerodynamics and photonics, and, and we're making, I'd say, significant progress. Again, the goal is to get it right the first time to make the design cost extremely small. What I'd like to do today is actually, since because I only have seven minutes, is to talk about one specific capability, and that's really the development of these optimizers. And within Differentiate, what we're trying to do is develop the ability to optimize system architectures. Think thermodynamic systems with, with turbines and compressors and, 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 and combustors, electrical circuits with resistors and capacitors and ductors, or, or materials. Uh, think molecules with carbon atoms, oxygen atoms, nitrogen atoms. What we like to do is, you know, given a certain input, and what I want to do is focus on electrical circuits, and the DC to DC converters in particular, given electricity at some voltage, I want electricity at another voltage, well, what combination of components gives me the circuit that, that maximizes my value proposition, efficiency, for example? And so, <clears throat> The design questions that we'd like to be able to answer really are which components, what are their specifications, what's the resistance, what's the inductance, how are they connected, is the reductor, inductor connect, connected to the capacitor, um, and, and really, and also how, how do we control the switches that might be in the circuit in an optimal way that yields performance that we want. Kind of, and so those are the electrical design questions we're trying to be, answer. And really the kind of the higher level question within the differentiate program is can we teach an algorithm to answer these questions? Um, and the answer is yes, but the world is complicated. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a second. So what we're trying to do is, is basically build, we're trying to effectively train our silicon um, to, to, to be able to build and construct circuits. And you know, training silicon engineers is very, very expensive, just like training carbon engineers is very, very expensive. And the design process that we use is really we build and bust lots of different circuit concepts and, and really train the silicon engineers you know, via the school of hard knocks. What we try and do is put together many different component combinations, connect them in different ways, and try different control schemes. And one of the uh, algorithms that we're trying to use to do this is called reinforcement learning, which you may have heard of before. It's been used to train to play games and that type of thing. And these are our algorithms in trying to maximize what is called the reward, which in our case you know, happens to be things like efficiency, cost, or perhaps net present value. Um, so we're doing this for a number of different applications, and we're doing it in, in electrical circuits in particular. And so what we've done is be able to train an algorithm, which illustrated on, on, the, on, the, on the chart on the right-hand part of the slide. But really we have the average reward, think efficiency, as a function of the number of different design concepts. 
And the red line, which is the reinforcement learning algorithm that's been trained, is indeed higher than the other two, suggesting that indeed there is the possibility that we can do this. We have an hour algorithm which can design circuits better and faster than the other state-of-the-art approaches. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, a challenge is the fact that these cir the circuits that were considered only have five components in them, um, which, which was really selected in order to minimize the cost of training um, to make the problem tractable in the time and budget available. Five component circuits are wonderful, but five component circuits are somewhat limiting in, in some applications. And so one of the fundamental challenges that we have within Differentiate, again, is that the world is extremely complicated. The design space is, for a lot of these problems is immense, and most of the choices are actually terrible, things you never want to do. And so really, if you look at these system architectures, the number of potential architectures scales exponentially with the number of components. And so as illustrated here, if you have maybe more than 25 components, you have so many architectures, you can't evaluate all the concepts in the life of the universe if you could do so at one millisecond per concept, which is crazy, I can't, we can't do that. So it's clear that we cannot train these systems by evaluating all the possible architectures. We have to learn to make good choices very quickly and efficiently weed out the bad ones. Um, and this problem was, 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 was referred to uh, by Sir James Lighthill back in 1973 as the combinatorial explosion. Um, which was extremely accurate, and actually the, his, I think his des designation of this fundamental problem led to a disinvestment in AI in the 1970s. And, and what I'm not, tr I'm not trying to accomplish that here, I'm just trying to raise that this is still a problem, but yet we have the tools to address it much more so than we could back in the 1970s. Um, and, and so what, what are we trying to do? Well, we're really what we're trying to do is we're trying to train the, or, or develop these silicon engineers using the knowledge base that we carbon engineers have developed over many, many years. What we want to do is, is not have these tools make the same mistakes that we did, but use the knowledge that we have to enable the, the rapid disposition of bad ideas. So we want to provide, essentially, design rules that these circuit algorithms uh, that can use in trying to evaluate these different circuit concepts. You know, don't connect the input to the output. That's a short circuit. That's never a good idea, for example. At the same time, we'd like to leverage our knowledge of, of the fundamental physics to actually construct surrogate evaluation tools that enable, that are very, very, that are as simple as they possibly can be to minimize their cost of training. And that enables us to develop these, this capability at, at low cost. And, and lastly, what we like to do is, is hopefully not recreate the wheel. I mean, one of the challenges, you have to actually generate circuit concepts, then evaluate circuit concepts. And if you're doing millions upon millions upon millions of concepts, that's very, very expensive. So we want to leverage historical data as much as possible. At the same time, within the machine learning community, there's this process called transfer learning where you can actually take quote unquote knowledge from one application to another, which can actually lower the training cost of subsequent applications for the, for the capability you have. And lastly, we like to do is just focus on what's important. You know, we, we have you know, many, many decisions to make. Sometimes we can do actually combine those decisions into one decision, which reduces the dimensionality of the problem and makes it much, much cheaper to solve. So, so within Differentiate, um, we think, I think that many, most of us, if not all of us in the program, think that machine learning methods offer tremendous potential for attractive design propositions, for attractive design, design value propositions. I've talked about one capability today, we're developing two others. The challenge really comes down to how do we manage the fact that the world is complex? How do we bring knowledge that we human engineers have to the table to reduce the cost of training and developing these capabilities? Um, and also, how do we use silicon, cap silicon engineers we developed to train future silicon engineers in some sense? If you have ideas about, how to, about this, these tools or solving some of these challenge problems, please do reach out. With that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, my colleague and, and fellow carbon-based engineer, uh, Catherine Greco. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Today, I'm going to be talking about how we can feed ourselves and our souls with protein derived from CO2. But first, I have a confession to make. I'm vegan. But don't worry, I'm not going to launch into a lecture on the impacts of animal agriculture. I think we all know that in the interest of the environment, we should be eating less meat. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about energy, the energy of food, and the importance of food security. Our current agricultural system wastes a massive amount of otherwise usable energy. The amount of solar energy that hits our agricultural lands is about 20 terawatts. Plants are able to convert about 5% of this energy into calories, so that leaves us with one terawatt worth of food. If we compare that to an alternative technology we could deploy on agricultural lands, such as solar panels, 
solar panels would be able to convert between three to four terawatts of this 20 terawatts into usable electricity. So now, some of you may be thinking, silly vegan, plants aren't that great after all. But we're compounding this problem by feeding a large portion of our crops to livestock. So if we consider the typical American diet, where about 30% of our calories come from animal sources, we would need to feed 890 gigawatts of this one terawatt of plant calories to animals. And so now we only have about 150 gigawatts of usable food energy from our original 20 terawatts of input. And so the problem with such an inefficient system is that we're not going to be able to keep up with the demand of a growing population. So here I'm showing projected global population from now until the year 2100. And by most accounts, we're expected to exceed 10 billion people by the year 2050. If we compare this to Earth's carrying capacity, or the number of people that our agricultural lands are able to sustain, this is also about 10 billion people. But the catch is, this is assuming that everyone's eating a vegan diet. If we feed our, if we, everyone was eating a conventional American diet, our carrying capacity wouldn't even be on this chart. It'd be about 2.5 billion people. This is also assuming that we're going to be able to sustain our current level of agricultural output. Due to climate change related disruptions, it's more likely that our carrying capacity will be somewhere between eight and nine billion people. And so even if everyone was going to go vegan, we don't have enough food to feed a growing population. And so we need to reimagine our food production system for better energy and food security. And so if we were to reimagine our food production system, we need new energy technologies that have higher yield and greater selectivity towards food. We also want these technologies to be powered with clean sources of energy, and we want our feedstock to not be susceptible to climate change related disruptions, and so CO2 would be a great carbon source to use. If we think about what foods these new technologies have to produce, we can sort them into roughly three broad categories, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. If we look at, look at the chemical structure of these macronutrients, carbohydrates and fats are chains of hydrocarbons with oxygen bonds. Proteins are a little bit different. They're chains of amino acids. And so amino acids have a chiral amine group. And so this chirality means that the orientation of the molecule is important in 3D space. And this chirality also makes these compounds more difficult to synthesize. And so if we consider our end goal where we need new technologies to produce food, it makes sense to target proteins as our initial target. As if we can achieve this, we should be well on our way to synthesizing both fats and carbohydrates as well. And so now let's talk tech. What technical pathways are there to be able to convert CO2 into protein? First, microbes are capable of uh, using CO2 as a carbon source rather than glucose. In this scenario, we need a reducing agent in the form of hydrogen and a nitrogen source in the form of ammonia. But both of these chemicals are able to be produced using green electricity. If we look at uh, what catalysts are responsible for reactions within the microbe, uh, they're enzymes. And so we could directly use enzymes to synthesize amino acids. And so the advantage here is that we're increasing our selectivity towards our product of interest, and we can also target specific amino acids that may be of interest for a complete, a complete nutritional profile. There are several enzymes that are available in nature to help us achieve this. One example is an ammonia lyase, which can add a chiral amine group to a hydrocarbon. Another is a decarboxylase, which can add a CO2 group to a hydrocarbon in the form of a carboxyl group, which is the other defining feature of an amino acid. But amination and carboxylation are two reactions that we know how to do with conventional chemistry. And so there's an opportunity to directly use green electrons in the form of electrochemical catalysis to upgrade CO2 to amino acids. And so no matter which technical route we choose, there's a great opportunity to abate both land use and emissions. Compared to conventional protein production, plant-based and cultivated meat have significantly lower land and CO2 footprint, but due to our farming practices, these are not negligible. However, with CO2 to protein, we only need enough land to capture the carbon, and it should be truly CO2 neutral if we're using 100% green electricity. And so now I'd like to conclude by considering what could be next for the future of agriculture. Advances in agriculture have been inextricably tied to advancement in human history. Our transition from a hunter-gatherer to a farming society is, is arguably responsible for our society today as we know it. More recently, we've had a great increase in agricultural output and a subsequent increase in population due to improvements in farming practices, such as the mechanization of farming, as well as the development of fertilizer with Haber-Bosch. More recently, we're continuing to use technologies to increase our food output and nutrition, using genetic engineering of crops, as well as alternative protein production, such as cultivated meat. 
And I propose that in the future, we have the opportunity to completely decouple crops and livestock from agriculture using technology. We can manufacture food as we would any other commodity, leading the way to a more secure and stable energy future. And so if you have ideas on how to make this future a reality, please reach out, I would love to chat. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. David Babson, who's going to be talking about another technology that could be disruptive for the future of food. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Catherine. And, um, you know, one of the advantages of going after Catherine in this particular uh, venue is she was able to give all of the context for what I'm going to talk about now. The unfortunate thing about going after Catherine is that I'm going after Catherine, and that was a really good show. And those of you that have stuck around for mine, um, you're going to be very disappointed. But let's dive right into what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So I'm David Babs. I'm a program director at RPE, and I'm going to be talking about growing up. Um, and as Catherine noted, climate change is changing um, the capacity of our, our ag system and our environment to provide the foods that, that our population, our growing population needs. And a lot of these changes, uh, the implications for the ag system um, cannot be predicted. Uh, one of the things, I, before coming to RPE, I was actually uh, at USDA. And one of the things that uh, was interesting about the, the projections for um, the, the cost of food uh, in the future, um, the ability for um, our, our ag system potentially to provide uh, a lot of food, um, the costs increases projected in the future due to climate change are, are perhaps less associated with the implications that, that we're highlighting on this slide, um, changes in, in, in uh, output due to drought and those sorts of things. It's actually the uncertainty, the risk of ensuring uh, the ag system that will potentially have a greater driver on increasing food costs. And so we need to think about um, you know, how it is that we can maintain a sustainable economy in a changing climate. The other thing about land is that um, beyond food, uh, we have a lot of other uses for, for land. Um, we've been talking a lot about climate change. There are implications of using terrestrial systems to do carbon management. We need to develop and service a future negative emissions industry. Um, the current bioeconomy values, um, the em embedded energy and biomass to produce renewable fuels and more sustainable fuels. Um, and so all of these things put uh, additional burdens on the land beyond just feeding um, people. We have uh, these other challenges that we need to be met. And so we really need to think about how we use land and what is the best use of land and addressing the challenges that we face going forward. And, you know, a, an extensive amount of time has been, you know, spent uh, characterizing the, the trouble we're in in terms of climate change and the plots that have been shown multiple times that show our path now goes through zero. We know that we have to not only reduce emissions down to zero but then go negative. We have to do the same thing on the land side as well. We have to slow the rate of conversion of of, um, of, of natural lands over to ag lands down to zero, and then we have to begin converting um, uh, ag, you know, ag lands back to natural lands or to lands that are managed uh, for ecosystem services. One of the things that is an opportunity for us to take advantage of in imagining the future systems that will allow us to meet our, our global challenges is that as we have been deploying more renewable power, both the cost and the carbon intensity of power has been going down. And this is actually decoupling um, process carbon intensity from energy intensity. And this allows us to engineer systems where these are, are substantially optimized uh, separately. One of the things that we could do in the, in the, uh, the food space is begin to imagine how we could engineer um, and, and take advantage of 
of new energy technologies to bypass the need for the traditional land intense ag system to produce foods. And we could imagine engineering indoor vertical farms to produce foods um, and take advantage of clean energy to power those systems. And I'm not talking about uh, just stacking greenhouses on top of each other. I'm talking about engineering systems of sufficient scale that they could be integrated into our municipal infrastructure, take in wastewater, use the nutrients from those um, waste streams in the aeroponic systems that feed the crops, and these systems could produce um, clean water, food, shortening supply chains, increasing sustainability, sparing land, and allowing the engineering and crop breeding that goes into supporting the current ag system to be focused on the actual outputs of the crops rather than on engineering and breeding crops to be more um, viable in a changing environment. You take out of the uh, equation here the thing that is the most uncertain in producing food, and that is the environment. And you do that by engineering the systems um, for producing these products in a controlled environment. So indoor vertical farming is not, is not completely novel. I mean, we have uh, vertical farms um, that are in operation now, and the number of these vertical farms has increased substantially over the past um, um, decade or so. Um, but what's being done primarily in the production of, of food in these indoor vertical farms now are things like microgreens and lettuce and um, strawberries and those sorts of things, and that we will continue to need to produce. But to be truly transformative and to, to maximize the, the capacity of land sparing that these systems could offer and to truly leverage the energy system to produce um, food products, we will need to go after and pursue through innovation the ability to produce the high energy dense um, cereal crops and grains um, like rice and soy and corn, those sorts of things. Um, and so there will be substantial challenges in co-designing um, and, and optimizing both the, the breeding and crop engineering strategies for the engineered environment in which they would grow, the lighting systems that would uh, allow them to um, propagate, and the handling of material flow systems that would be associated with this. There are opportunities um, when we're thinking about crop in engineering and, and, um, and breeding where, like I said, if you take crops from outdoors and bring them in and you take out of the equation uh, the uncertainty of the, of the climate, your breeding strategies can now, as I've shown here, be directed at the, the, the products that you want, the yield that you want. And actually, you could engineer and breed crops to have more nutritious foods or better tasting um, outputs. And you're able to you know, extend the growing uh, season year-round, avoid pesticides, and a lot of the other things that are associated with this. Indeed, if we are able to grow up, um, we will be able to substantially reduce the necessary um, uh, natural resource inputs in producing the same amount of, of food. We will eliminate a lot of the, the, the potential um, negative impacts of large-scale industrial farming, uh, like you know, eutrophication, runoff, um, and pesticide use. And we would be able to spare land that is currently used in the production of those foods um, in the purposes of serving other uh, global challenges like carbon drawdown um, and increasing biodiversity, and clean water, um, and habitats, and those sorts of things. So there's a lot of advantages there. So with that, it's time to grow up. Um, happy to talk to anybody about this uh, later. Um, and uh, thanks for, for joining us. I'll now turn it over to Simon, who will moderate the questions. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone else, for some fantastic fast pitches. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have questions on any of our uh, fast pitch topics today, please submit them through the uh, QR code on the back of your name tag, and uh, they'll show up here on my tablet. So to begin, uh, there's a question here for Catherine. So how uh, do you see a roadmap for these technologies where they may eventually become economical compared to conventional food production? 
sorry. So uh, what, will these new technologies that you propose ever be economical compared uh, to okay. conventional food production, and, and how do you see that happening? Right. Yeah, so I think that the key to making these, this process economical is actually the carbon capture and conversion to C1, C2 carbons, uh, because from there it's just a couple of additional reaction steps um, to get to a simple amino acid. Um, and so we showed, like we had a preliminary TEA analysis that said that if we can get to $100 a ton for DAC, we should be able to get a dollar per kilogram amino acid, which is the current uh, price for feed-grade amino acids. So I think the carbon capture is key, has been a theme of this uh, summit. Okay, um, next question uh, for Dave. Do you need to speed the resources to recreate, uh, do you need to spend the resources to recreate machine learning algorithms for each new design problem? Um, well, I guess that is a, a fundamental chan challenge that we have. Hopefully the answer is, is no. I mean, certainly as we move from problem A to problem B, we'd like to figure out how to use as much kind of knowledge as we've cr created in problem A um, to really give us a good initial start at developing the capability for problem B. There are techniques called transfer learning that have been employed historically that have worked, and the challenge really becomes how close are those two problems, and is, is it really appropriate to try and transfer knowledge that has been stored from one problem to another? If the answer is yes, if there are similarities in the physics, for example, then indeed there are good ways to, try to, to use earlier uh, knowledge in some sense and, and giving us a good step forward on, on the second problem. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so the next question is one for the, the seafloor mining. Um, they ask, how do autonomous systems reduce environmental impacts on the seafloor? And so um, I guess that warrants a comparison with today's approaches, which is sort of broad brush uh, approaches to polymetallic module harvesting where perhaps a dredge might be used or something that's not a specific collector. Imagine a, a giant vacuum cleaner. Um, so the autonomous systems that uh, we're proposing are ones that can perform uh, selection on the fly. So if there are uh, nodules that are uh, colonized with seafloor organisms, we can leave them alone. Um, say there are, are rocks that are not valuable com compared to uh, the, the manganese nodules themselves, they can be avoided. Um, okay. uh, I think uh, this tablet isn't uh, updating questions at the moment. If uh, one of our folks could bring up some uh, questions on a piece of paper or something like that, I'd appreciate it. There he is. The QR code on the back of their badges is how they send the questions. I think he's saying, like, the thing's not working. Yeah, this is still. Thanks a lot. All righty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, sorry about that. The next question is for Catherine. Uh, what avenues have you come upon in your investigation for ensuring that the food tastes good? <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, so I've been primarily investigating amino acids, which actually taste really salty. So I would say that um, they will not taste good, at least initially. But I think the key to flavor is being able to synthesize fats. So that's going to be the most important component in terms of uh, developing a CO2 to food product that will actually taste good. Right, the next question is for Dave Babson. Uh, are there ways to use natural light for vertical farming applications to minimize the need for LEDs? There are, certainly are ways to, to use natural light in some of these systems. They can, um, I've seen uh, you know, light concentrators and other things that can be used. But um, there's also potentially a lot of benefit to, to, to using artificial light. Um, some of the, the projects that, that we've been looking into to funding um, uh, enable uh, the the possibility of uh, co-designing your your crop with the lighting system and the lights the, the LED lights are very efficient and the actual wavelength of the light can be controlled in a way that can you know stimulate different enzyme cascades in uh, a crop so that you can actually get far greater um, richness in the engineered um, 
co-optimization between your crops and your system if you use uh, artificial light. Additionally, um, the ability um, to, to scale um, and to achieve the full benefits of being able to um, decouple your farming system from the, uh, from the environment, to truly be a controlled environment. Um, it is uh, uh, prudent to, um, to engineer lighting systems, um, LED lighting systems in, in, those, um, in those farms. Thanks. Uh, Dave, too. So how is machine learning being used today to optimize energy efficiency and innovation in technologies like lithium polymer batteries and hydrogen fuel cells? Using it within the differentiate program to try and develop new materials, um, which hopefully will enable those devices to perform better. Um, we're also trying at the same time to figure out how to better architect systems like I talked about today. But certainly materials discovery um, for targeted applications is, is, is something that's been invested that significantly, or is invested in significantly, and we're continuing to make investments in it because we think it's a great way to look for new materials that offer better performance. Epson, what are the biggest challenges to economic scaling of vertical farming? The best one? The, the biggest challenges to economical scaling of vertical farming. Now, um, because I gave this presentation on vertical farming, it shouldn't be assumed that I'm an expert on what the <laughs> challenges are in this space. Um, but from the communications I've had with um, you know, some of the, the, the farms, you know, the economics um, for these systems are, um, you know, really closely tied to the, the price at which they can get the electricity, both to run the LED uh, lighting systems, which can be very costly, um, but also the, um, the air conditioning systems that allow the uh, transrespired um, water to be captured, and that's actually one of the things about these uh, vertical farm systems that is um, uh, really valuable, is that they reduce the, the overall water needs for producing a crop by over 90%. But a lot of that is a function of being able to go after and recover the transrespired uh, water from those, those systems. Two things are the biggest. Um, you know, marginal cost drivers for these systems, the, the air handling systems and the electricity. Um, and so engineering more efficient uh, lighting schemes and systems as well as uh, more efficient, you know, and, and tuned HVAC systems for these under vertical farms um, would be um, probably the greatest challenges to, to scaling. Thanks. So the next question is on seafloor mining. Uh, can you comment on the regulatory environment for seafloor mining in international waters? Well, it is a complicated scenario, but in general, uh, the most of the world is a signatory to the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. The United States is not, and we're an observer nation. Um, if you were a country who, were, who was interested in uh, seabed mining in international waters, you would petition this group and then uh, uh, resolve a permit through them. Uh, however, there's a caveat where the United States uh, permitted le uh, seafloor leases pre-Convention of the Law of the Sea. And today, only one company in the United States has these leases. It's Lockheed Martin. They just asked for a renewal um, of these uh, leases this year uh, so that uh, they can they demonstrate their intention um, of continuing an interest in this area. Uh, and that, that is all uh, separate from uh, mining within the exclusive economic zone where you know, if it's within 200 nautical miles of a, of a country, that country has the right to extract minerals from that seafloor as if it was uh, equivalent to their land. So uh, they do not need to notify the International Seabed Authority at all. Okay, so the next question is on, um, is a question for Catherine again. Uh, what technology do we not have today that would enable protein production from CO2? Yeah, so I mean, I already touched on this earlier, but I think you know one technology that we definitely need is economical direct air capture. But I think in terms of the direct synthesis of protein from hydrocarbons, we really need chiral catalysts uh, that are able to selectively aminate um, the 
uh, hydrocarbon to form that, that chiral amine group as only one is, is bioavailable. Uh, or we could need cell systems that have, can do cell-free enzymatic synthesis. And so actually one of our RPE performers is, in design is working on this, and I'm really excited about their work um, because I think that a cell-free system, uh, maybe like that's economical, could be the fastest path to uh, CO2 to protein production. Thanks. Uh, so Dave, too, you talked about generative methods. Uh, could you discuss what progress has been made there? Um, certainly. Actually, within the program, we're investing in, in generative tools for a wide range of applications. I mean, inverse design tools have been around for a long time via different approaches. And so what we've focused on are kind of problem areas where things like the adjoint method have been employed uh, previously. So we're looking at, at the design of airfoils, the design of wings, the design of turbine blades. Um, and we're also looking at, at the design of photonic systems as well and trying to divine, design um, better diffraction gratings and that type of thing. Um, and we've made significant progress. I mean, the, the wing, 2D wing problem works extremely well. We've moved on to 3D wings, which are much more complex. There's much more, many more design dimensions, and so the problem, you know, as I mentioned before, the problems get much, much more difficult. Um, we've also moved on to actually adding, looking at not just aerodynamics, but adding structural considerations as, as well as heat transfer considerations into the inverse design problem. And all these things work. Um, and then we're getting to the point where they're working well enough for problems that are actually of practical engineering interest. So I think that you know, going forward, things like generative models are going to re really be key tools that we as engineers use in a wide range of applications. Thanks. OK, uh, next question is for David Babson. Uh, does indoor farming increase carbon efficiency for crops? And what is scalability potential and ultimately projected increase in food production costs at commodity scale? and uh, greenhouse, at, greenhouse at the current U.S. farming acreage? Um, well, I'll answer the first part, and then you'll have to ask me the second part again, because I didn't catch that. Sure. Um, the first part, I, I believe the question was, does indoor farming you know, confer a carbon efficiency benefit? Um, and the answer is not, not necessarily. However, um, the the crops f that are you know bred and engineered for indoor vertical farming can be selected to have phenotypes that would improve their overall carbon efficiency. Now it actually may be a parameter that you would want to to breed and select for in an indoor vertical farm to increase the overall yield and productivity of that of that crop. So um, the, the great thing about again moving towards you know a controlled environment farm for certain um, uh, food and crop production systems would be that the effort and energy that is, you know, that goes into um, improving crops um, is, you know, largely taken up by um, developing, in, in, uh, you know, improvements in those crops for, you know, an unpredictable environment. So the opportunity for taking that out of the equation means that there's all kinds of other um, things that your engineering and breeding strategies could be targeting. Um, and you know, it, it, many of those things would, I think, um, be informed by the economics of, of the system, um, the, the, the products that need to be produced, and the, the characteristics that you want to have in, in, the, in the crops that you're farming indoors. And what was the second part so of the question? The, the second part is, what is scalability potential and ultimately projected increase in food production costs, if any, at commodity scale? Um, <clears throat> a lot of these things have not uh, been fully investigated um, because there hasn't been a, you know, a large um, a focus area on producing the commodities. Um, because of the inherent challenges of actually being able to produce those at scale. Right now, if you were to look at what the, the, the price of producing a commodity crop would be in an indoor vertical farm at current electricity prices and whatnot, um, they would be substantially higher, um, you know, for orders of magnitude higher than the, the corresponding um, commodity crops that, that are produced on millions of acres of land in the, in the bread basket. However, um, that is why there, you know, needs to be, you know, focused um, innovations to to drive down and bring down 
um, the cost of producing these uh, crops in a more sustainable way that leverages uh, low-cost, low-carbon power, where the future marginal costs of producing those foods or products are tied to something like electricity that has a decreasing marginal cost as opposed to land that is going to have an increasing marginal cost over time as there are greater demands on the land for all of the challenges that I outlined. Thanks. Okay, uh, the next question is on seafloor mining. They ask, how do you measure how much damage you are doing or not doing uh, to the ocean floor during any nodule collection activity? So this is a really interesting question that touches on long-standing research on seafloor mineral extraction. Uh, there are several areas of concern. Uh, one is the, the resuspension of sediments on the seafloor. And uh, the way that that is quantified is through uh, the variety of techniques, but the, the resuspension and then the resettling rates of sediment. Uh, so today, uh, collectors or well, scientific sampling instrumentation would be deployed at, place, at strategic locations before and after uh, seafloor mining uh, endeavors. And uh, the uh, rates of sediment sinking would be precisely measured in situ inside closed volumes inside these, uh, these sensor systems. And then the sinking rates are then added to models that are used to determine the uh, ultimate time scales of these uh, sediment plumes, how long they would stay in the water column after the mining operation has, uh, has concluded. And then estimates of uh, impacts to pelagic ecosystems would be conducted from that. Uh, when looking at uh, actual benthic disturbance, uh, pho photography is probably, uh, you, you could use, uh, you could say that that is probably the main way of quantifying uh, seafloor disruption. So again, uh, some detailed surveys before and after mining operations will show how much disturbance there has been to the sediment, the um, simplification of topography, so the complexity of the seafloor uh, is proportional to the uh, ecological diversity. And uh, you could imagine if, if the seafloor becomes flattened through some machinery, um, the biodiversity uh, would decrease. So that is one metric that uh, the uh, ecosystem, through which the ecosystem impacts are evaluated. All right, I have a question for Dave too. Uh, how big a challenge is the cost of data scaling for AI ML based solutions for energy technology? Um, that, that was uh, how big is the, how challenging is the cost of scaling in some sense? It, the, the cost of data for scaling. Cost of data. Well, yeah, the cost of data is a major challenge. It is a major cost associated with the development of this capability. So we're really trying to do all we can to minimize the cost of data. Um, by really actually trying to carefully structure the tools that we're developing to minimize the number of weights that are in them, for example, because the more weights you have, the more training data you need. We're also trying to figure out how to leverage as much historical data as possible. So within the program, and actually what we're trying to do in the program is create historical data that people can use in the future um, by carefully archiving and things like that. Um, and, and certainly, I, I mentioned it in my talk, things like transfer learning. And certainly we've, we've discovered that, you know, if we develop the ability to design compressor blades, for example, there are a lot of design similarities or similar design considerations when you're trying to design turbine blades. And so if you have a, a compressor design blade network, you can use it as a good initial guess for developing your turbine blade design network. And that can dramatically reduce the training, the amount of training data that you have and you need and significantly regard, re reduce the cost of developing that turbine blade capability. Thanks. Uh, next question for Catherine. Some amino acids are easier than others to accumulate in microbes. Are there priority amino acids to make from CO2 versus others? Sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> so some amino acids are easier than others to accumulate in microbes. Okay. Are there priority amino acids to make from CO2 versus others? Yeah, so I think this is a great question. So I think priority should probably be lysine. Uh, so lysine is the amino acid that's most limited in plant resources, um, and many developing countries are lysine limited. So I think that that would be a great first target. Um, it's also used in animal feed, so it could be an economical choice as well in terms of a, having a product to be able to sell to a first market. Okay. Uh, a question for Dave Babson. Would you be interested in carbon capture integrated with HVAC units for vertical farming purposes? Yeah. I'm always interested sure. in it, removing carbon from the atmosphere. 
right? Um, the next question, uh, this is a question on seafloor mining again. How do you power the mining, both on the seafloor and in space? Well, so the, the paradigm of uh, low impact, small scale, autonomous deep sea mining uh, is integrated, is integral with uh, renewable energy harvesting. So as I mentioned in the talk, you know, by uh, shipping hydrocarbons thousands of miles offshore to use, to, to run diesel generators, uh, which is the state of the art today, to power mining operations is inordinately expensive, not just because of the, the cost of the uh, fossil fuels and the cost of the transport, but the cost to maintain the infrastructure at sea to convert that fossil fuel into energy and then you know, use that in the mining operation. Uh, so you know, being agnostic to uh, renewable energy generation type uh, I would say the most important thing is to uh, harvest the energy in situ. And you know, in the open ocean, there are some options there, not too many. Uh, the most promising may be wind energy, although uh, this would necessitate floating offshore wind turbine technology. It's currently in development. Uh, there are potentially hydrokinetic options, but in the deep ocean, uh, current velocities are pretty low. So any solution there would have to uh, be fairly large geometrically, and uh, we would rely on harvesting energy effectively from um, slow, massive movements of uh, bodies of water. Uh, the last potentially really interesting method of, of energy harvesting uh, at sea is uh, generation from hydrothermal power. Um, I'm sure you've seen these videos of, of black smokers and uh, hydrothermal vents on the sea floor. Uh, these represent uh, wonderful energy hotspots on the seafloor, otherwise a very low energy environment, and uh, they can provide kilowatts worth of uh, power through uh, harvesting systems like a, a Peltier engine or something like that. Uh, there are some risks there, including the fact that hydrothermal vents tend to uh, come and go unpredictably, and they can move around. So uh, any energy harvesting system that relied upon hydrothermal vents would need to be mobile. Uh, there are some other issues with precipitation of, uh, of ceramics on heat exchanges as well. But this is an active area of, uh, of research, and uh, energy harvesting at sea is, is, maintain is still a formidable challenge. Now, as for space, um, this is something that's, that's further afield, but uh, I could say that the current solutions are solar and potentially nuclear. And uh, this is not something that RPE currently investigates, although uh, if you do have ideas, we'll be more than willing to, to discuss them. Uh, so, uh, moving on, I've got a, another question here for Catherine. Uh, what form, liquid or solid, will the amino acids take in order for humans to ingest them? Ah, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, hmm. So I would say that the ideal end product would be in the form of some sort of powder, so a solid. So either that could potentially be like a supplement to be used in smoothies or something like that. Um, but for the electrochemical or enzymatic synthesis methods, uh, you will have to precipitate out your amino acid at the end. So there ha would have to be a crystallization step for purification and separation. Thanks. Uh, Dave, too. Uh, what are the next industries that you would leverage this machine learning technology for? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, our focus has been on the energy industry and energy challenge problems, but there's really no reason that the tools we've been developing couldn't be applied in many other industries as well. I mean, the, engine, en the energy and the fundamental, engineering, the fundamental engineering problems really aren't that different. Um, so chemical processing, I mean, there's just a tremendous range of applications where these tools can be deployed. Thanks. So a question for David Babson. Uh, how can vertical farming overcome the challenge of higher cost development within cities instead of remote, low cost farmland? I'm sorry, what? So how can vertical farming overcome the challenge of high cost uh, development within cities uh, instead of low cost farmland? I mean, I think one of the things would be, you know, siting of where these systems physically are in, in the city. I can imagine actually a lot of the ones, a lot of the, the uh, indoor farms that I've seen, um, you know, tend to be actually in like, you know, industrial parks around a, a, a city. Um, so they wouldn't actually need to be, you know, on Fifth Avenue, <laughs> but, you know, they could certainly be in proximity to the city 
um, take advantage of the, you know, the integration into municipal infrastructure to offer the ability for um, engineering circularity into that city um, and shortening supply chains without, you know, being, um, you know, competing for the highest, uh, most valuable uh, real estate. I think that would just be a, a siting business uh, sort of uh, consideration. Thanks. And, Okay, and uh, last question here, uh, Catherine. What are the sources for the theoretical reductions in CO2 emissions and land use for the alternative proteins? Right, so, I mean, I don't have the quantitative numbers off the top of my head right now, but I believe um, for, so the land use should just be the land you need for DAC, which I think is um, 10 meters squared per year if you're doing a ton of amino acids. I have to double check the numbers, but yeah, so the, and the CO2 impact should be truly neutral. Um, yeah, so it should be zero. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we're out of time today, so this concludes the fast pitch session on natural resources. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and as always, uh, please be in touch. We're more than willing to continue discussions with you on these topics. Thank you.